Biblical Marriage Lesson 5, The Key of Teamwork. Uh, the Lord began to deal with me when we was writing these lessons a couple of years ago. Marriage is about teamwork. And many times, people treat the marriage as, we'll say, like an NBA team or we'll say a football team, things of that nature, where you have the star, we'll say the star athlete of the team, and everybody says, oh, well, Michael Jordan, well, he, he took the Bulls and he did that with the Bulls when back in the heyday. Or I say, LeBron James, well, he, he this and he that. And we know that's not true. But anyway, it's one of those things where they, a lot of people put emphasis on one key player and they negate the rest of the team. Well, for biblical marriage, or we'll say marriage in, period, marriage in general, many people focus on, well, my wife does this, my wife does all that, my wife does, and they put all of the focus or all of the work and the, the, all of the burden, that's probably the best word, on, this, well, on the wife, or the wife puts all the burden on the husband, and they don't work together as a team, which is every burden and everything that's in a marriage is supposed to be teamwork, and it's supposed to be, we'll say, uh, we'll say evenly distributed as far as the burden and the weight of the marriage goes and all the work that goes into a marriage, but also the things that are required of a marriage of what the responsibilities are are supposed to be evened out as well. Now, that doesn't mean that you know the man should do all the woman's work and, and she barely does anything. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the man's supposed to take care of his responsibilities and not put everything off on her, and she's supposed to take care of her responsibilities and not put everything off on him. And then there's times where maybe if, if we'll say for this, if one's sick, then we know there's a temporary exchange to be passed over to that other spouse because we understand the situation is not so much of the person refuses to do it, it's the person may be inapt at the moment for just a small season of why they can't. And then the teamwork kicks in, and the other person steps in, helps out, and then it levels back out once everything gets back to normal. So we see that. And, but we need to have the key of teamwork throughout our marriages, but in a lot of aspects of, we'll say, Christendom. So biblical marriage is, is about honoring God via the vision he has given the husband, but the heart of marriage is teamwork. So we understand biblical marriage is all about honoring God. Everything that we do, whether it's our marriage, anything that we do as Christians is about honoring God. Everything, even intimacy, is about honoring God. Well, how is that supposed to be? Well, it's not like you pray and you know, have a worship session before you get intimate. No, no, no. It's about because you're saying we have joined ourselves together. God has blessed this marriage. We are becoming one and we are doing this to honor God because he's the one that has put us together. We glorify his name that he is bringing us to be one, not only in, we'll say, spirit or attitude or mind, but also in the flesh as well. And we see that everything goes to glorify God, especially in marriage, but anything we do as Christians should honor God. So everything the couple is to accomplish in life requires teamwork. Everything the couple is to accomplish in life requires teamwork. Doesn't matter what it is, it's going to require teamwork. Amen. John Maxwell has said, teamwork makes the dream work. Now, we used to kind of mock that in the military. Teamwork makes the dream work because we knew there were some people on your team that were lame. <laughs> that should not be in a marriage. You shouldn't have lame people in your marriage. Everybody should be doing their part to make the teamwork make the dream work. Anyway, so this is not only reflected in ministry or big tasks for a couple's marriage, but more so in the daily grind of normal life. I'm going to read that again because many times we see a lesson like this. We say, yeah, they're doing these things for God and they're doing this in, in church or they're doing this as an outreach and they're doing this. No, no, no. What we're talking about is not just those things. Yes, we know that takes teamwork. Like God's graffiti is just coming through that. That takes teamwork. It takes a lot of teamwork. But we're also talking about the daily grind. The daily grind is where things, especially in a marriage, we could also apply it to a church. That's where things tend to fall apart. Why? Because when you got a big sham wow that everybody's excited about, everybody's willing to put, you know, be all hands on deck. But when it's the consistency of having just that time to keep, keep doing what they know to do, keep doing what needs to be done, that's where things can fall apart quickly and it begins to unravel and it's not a good situation. So this is not only reflected in a ministry or big task for a couple's marriage, but more so in the daily grind of normal life. That is what can get can seem mundane, just the in and out of, 
Every day I get up, every day I do this, every day I do that, every day I end up doing this, and then the next day I just do it all over again. And if you're not careful, that can get mundane, and that's when we become not satisfied, not, not content and not satisfied to where we start looking for other things, and that's when wandering eyes start taking place, and that's when people start getting in trouble. And so we've got to realize that having this normal grind, so to speak, is what should what we should apply our teamwork to, but also help build our team as we progress in it. A wife is not only to help me to the husband, but the husband should also help the wife accomplish the things she needs to accomplish. So the spirit, soul, and flesh of the husband and wife are to be one, Genesis 2.24. As the couple works together, this creates a deeper relationship within all three of these aspects. I want to say that again. As the couple works together, this creates a deeper relationship within all three of these aspects. You know, there are sometimes, you know, I, I look at, I will look at couples and things like that, and we say, "Man, you know, kind of like they they do a lot, but it seems like they never do things together." And when that's the case, typically not not a hundred percent across the board, but typically that's when you find there seems to be extracurricular activities with other people there seems to be all these things that start to get into that marriage and then the next thing you know they fall apart it's when now I'm not saying well they should be doing every single thing together we get that because like men's discipleship I don't expect Miss Tiffany to come to that she doesn't expect me to show up for women's discipleship we get that because a man needs time with other fellow guys and a woman needs time needs time with fellow women because that's proper but more times than not, they should be doing things together because it keeps their union intact and it keeps them working on the teamwork and it keeps them, we'll say, communicating and keeps them intimate, not just on a sexual level, but it keeps them intimate in many regards because you're sharing those moments together. It's like many times, this typically aggravate me because I don't like doing things without her. I'll say, oh, you're, you're doing this? She'll say, yeah, I was going to go. We'll just use this example. Yeah, I was going to go to Sam's Club today and get this or get that. You're going without me? And it's like, that seems silly, but it's like, I don't like, I don't like doing things without her, and I don't like her doing things without me. And it's not like I'm obsessive about it sometimes. No, that's a joke. That's a joke. It's not like I'm obsessive about it, but, there, but I do enjoy doing things with her. And I really think that that's one thing that has made our marriage so healthy for almost 20 years now is because we do enjoy those things together. Even if it's just sitting down to watch a TV show together, we, we wait for each other because why? Because that's moments that, yes, we're watching TV, but we're doing it together. We can pause it and talk about, can you believe what just happened? I can't believe that either. Or whatever the situation is. You know, there's more, a lot more to it than that. But we do those things together because as the couple works together, it creates a deeper relationship. Now, again, it doesn't have to be every single thing that you do, but we should endeavor to find different things and more than one thing that we do together as a married couple to keep that relationship and communication and everything going and working. So the more a couple argues or chooses not to work together, the more division takes root within the marriage, making what should be one into two. So the more a couple argues or chooses not to work together, when you choose to not work together, that's, that's not good. Now, again, we know that there may be situations here and there where it's proper to be, you know, to have, uh, we'll say to split up and conquer more ground or cover more things. We get that. But for the heart of a lot of what we do as a married couple, we should want to do together, if at all possible. Amen. So Hebrews twelve fifteen says, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Ephesians 4, 31, 32 says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. So here we have the biblical mandate to get rid of bitterness, get rid of rage, get rid of anger, get rid of harsh words, get rid of slander, get rid of evil behavior. But then, then I love how Paul writes this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, all right, get rid of this, but here's what you need to do instead. Here's what you need to put into play. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. We know that in any team, you may, you're going to have moments where you're not the nicest to your teammate. <laughs> you're just, you know, 
There's going to be days where you, you, you really love each other, and then we're talking about on a bigger scale, not just biblical marriage, but that's the heart of our lesson, where you have these moments where you don't want to be around them right now, but you've got to work together. You may, not, you may not always like them, but we should always love them. Well, even in a marriage, we should always love one another, but there's going to be moments we don't like each other. And but, so what we got to do is now we got to let the Word kick into our life and our understanding and not just know the Word, but do the Word, and we allow the love to come to, to the top of our emotions to get rid of these things that are listed in verse 31 and to let the things in verse 32 arise to say, all right, I got to put my flesh under and I got to let verse 32 arise within me to be kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven us. So teamwork is more than just accomplishing things together, but reinforcing the team as one unit. Teamwork is more than just accomplishing things together, but reinforcing the team. That's one of the things I love about God's graffiti, and I know we just come out of that, so I may use that from time to time in our lesson this morning. But one of the things that we desire to accomplish through that is re- reinforcing the team. We'll say the, the body of Christ, the soldiers of God, of reinforcing of, hey, you're not alone. You're not the only, you're not the only soldiers in this region. We're here with you. Well, yes, we may go to separate churches, but we're in this together. And the more that the body of Christ can build upon that and reinforce one another and to solidify those relationships, and if we understand that, why don't we do that in our marriages? That we reinforce one another. You know, honey, I love going to church with you. Honey, I love doing this with you. You know, and that, that's just not the woman speaking. That's also the man. I love doing this with you. I love spending that time with you. You know, this may not be my favorite thing to do, but I love doing it with you. Why? Because I love being around you. And it's those moments that you reinforce the team that weeds out vain imaginations. Because sometimes you could be weeding out vain imaginations that you don't even know is there. If you say, honey, I I love doing this with you, or I love doing that with you. Sometimes, I know this may sound weird to some people, but Miss Tiffany's getting ready, and I may not have to go anywhere for the moment, because most of the time I'm working from home or doing things. And if she's getting ready, and I know she's about to leave, I'll go where our bedroom is, and we have the master bath. I'll go, and I'll stand there and lean against the door frame and just watch her put on makeup and just talk to her. And sometimes she'll look at me and say, did you need something? No, ma'am. Why? And, I, and to some people, that'll sound corny, and some people will say, well, that's not a real man. He wouldn't do that. Well, I love my wife, and I know if she's about to leave and about to go somewhere, I know I'm not going to see her for a few minutes, so why not spend five minutes with her, ten minutes with her, just to say, hey, I love you, I'm thinking about you, I, I know you got to go, I know you got to go to work or whatever errand you're about to run, just wanted to see you just a couple minutes before you left. Yeah. Instead of having the heart of, well, when, you know, when she closes the door, well, I'm glad she's gone, because that's the way some people treat their spouse, and that could be the man or the woman. <laughs> but no, we, we do things to reinforce the team to do more things together. But reinforcing the team as one unit that allows more time and creates an appreciation for one another, producing more intimacy on various levels. When you show yourself friendly, you have friends. That's the word of God. When you show yourself friendly to your spouse, you will have more intimacy. That's just not talking about sexual. We'll get to that in another lesson. I think it's the next lesson next week. But it's one of those things where there's more than just that kind of intimacy. There's intimacy on many levels of sharing your heart with one another, just being best friends. Because when you, have that, when you have that mentality of being best friends and being able to love one another and being able to share things with one another, that will help your relationship more than anything else. Amen. So the enemy desires to attack this attitude of teamwork within a marriage to feel isolation or desertion. That's what the enemy attacks. He tries to attack the mind to say, your spouse doesn't love you, your spouse doesn't want you, whatever the, whatever the mindset is, whatever the, the we'll say, the uh, fiery dart he's trying to throw at you, that's what he's going to use. Because if he can get you to separate in your mind, your heart will follow suit, and then you find yourself in divorce. And that's not the God's design for marriage. Husbands and wives must do their part to not allow any room for the enemy to use this attack against their spouse. So in other words, we should be working on this for ourselves to put out vain imaginations and not let the enemy separate us, but we should also do what we can to eliminate that from even our spouse's heart and mind, that they don't feel vain imagination, they don't feel those things and be attacked with those things. So be, 
be there for your spouse and use teamwork and to not only fill in gaps when one needs assistance, but do things together. So getting the best of one another. Oh, we could, for a region like this, we could stay here all day. Getting the best of one another. The more teamwork that takes place within marriage, the more each spouse should receive the best from one another. The more teamwork that takes place within a marriage, the more each spouse should receive the best of one another, from one another. Alleviating burdens from one another displays love and companionship that should be part of the foundation of the marriage as God designed. That means you help one another. That's teamwork. Galatians 6 2. Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Well, Pastor, that's talking about the church. Well, many times the church is talked about as marriage. Jesus being the husbandman, the church being the bride, or however you want to put that. They will say the saints being the bride. Well, if God is going to relate that, then that means marriage is important to God. So we're to bear one another's burdens. If, if the model will say many times is applied to the church, why not, if God's going to use the example of the church in a marriage, why not use the things that are designed for a church to be in the marriage? As far as like the example of such verses like this, bear ye one another's burdens. That doesn't just apply to the church. That should be in the marriage as well. That's what I'm getting at. And so fulfill the law of Christ. So bearing a spouse's burdens not only helps the other spouse, but it also helps the marriage. A marriage is like the church in many regards. But when you help your spouse bear burdens, it helps the bigger picture of what's happening. That's like if, it will say if somebody sees, well, pastor wants me to do this. Well, pastor wants me to do that. Well, if all you're focused on is just doing what I'm asking you to do, you're missing the bigger picture of what God's trying to accomplish within our church. And if we only focus on, well, my spouse wants me to do this, my spouse wants me to do that, well, maybe that's helping accomplish the bigger picture of what the marriage is supposed to be accomplishing. But if we're so focused on the one little thing, we miss the bigger picture. We miss the heart behind it. So working together should not be a responsibility for marriage, but a, de a desire within each person because love is present and God has joined the two together to be one. So Mark 10, 9 says, What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. We know that's not the first time we've seen that verse, but we need to make sure that we're using these verses to apply to our marriages so we don't allow things to separate us. So when teamwork is not chosen as a method of operation, that spouse, or each spouse, if both oppose teamwork, can be creating a division of what God has joined together. So many times we'll see this and say, well, don't let other family members into your marriage, or don't let this person into your marriage, don't let that person into your marriage, because it'll separate you, because it's just going to you know, break together what God has joined together. Well, what about if it's the people in the marriage? What about if we ourselves start allowing what God has joined together, we allow the enemy to attack our mind and our heart, and we begin to be what is pulling together, pulling apart what God has joined together. That's where you'll find that not all, but I would dare say over half divorces, that's, that's what you'll see, is it's not necessarily somebody else butting in, but maybe the ideology of somebody else or something washing over one of the spouses or maybe both of them at times, and they begin to, in their own heart, and their own mind, begin to separate, and that's what really divides the marriage. Because nobody can really force you to get a divorce. Nobody can really force you to get a divorce. Now, by that, I, I know of a couple people that have been given a, a bill of divorcement, and it wasn't their choice. They wanted to work it out. But what I'm saying is if you're the one filing the paperwork, nobody forced you to do that. So many times, and we'll have a whole lesson on divorce and remarriage because we know that's coming up, and that's also important for us as the body of Christ to understand as well because some people, some people take very hard stances on that that are unbiblical. Anyway, many times people will read this verse and think about others creating a division or issue for another couple's marriage, but how many times does a couple hinder their own marriage or create unneeded issues, sabotaging the very marriage they claim to support until death do them part? That's like as a pastor, I've had a couple in my three years of pastoring, pastoring, not a couple together, but a couple of people that have essentially 
we'll use volleyball terms, Olympus are going on, so we'll just use that. They've kind of set up their own spike. They set it up to spike the ball and say, that's the reason I'm leaving. That's the reason I don't want you to be my pastor. That's the reason I don't want to no longer be in this church or whatever. They set it up themselves knowing the reaction they would get so that they could leave pointing fingers at the other team of we got the advantage on you. Because you didn't volley it the way that you should have. You didn't handle this the way we wanted you to. We knew setting this spike up that we would slam dunk this in your face that we could leave and be right in our own eyes. Now, how many times does that happen in a marriage? That people set up the perfect equation and they spike the ball on their spouse and say, see, that's the reason I'm divorcing you. This is the reason I'm leaving you. When they themselves have been the one to set it up. <laughs> uh, this is teaching pretty good. I'm telling you, this is teaching a lot different than it did two years ago. Lester Summerall said in his book, God's Blueprint for a Happy Home, which I highly encourage, by the way. He also has a book on sex, which I didn't know for years that he wrote. They're both very good, and it's Lester Summerall. So put that in your doctrine of how harsh and how fiery Lester Summerall's preaching and teaching is. You put those books in your repertoire, and it will help you understand what the word says because yeah anyway marriage is not a temporary arrangement it's a commitment for life marriage is not a temporary arrangement it is a commitment for life each spouse should seek should be committed to forever with their spouse now i'm going to tell off on myself not a bragging right but before i ever before i well well of course before i wrote this doctrine but uh before i wrote this curriculum Miss Tiffany and I, when we got married, when I had written a song for her, and the title of it was, I Could See Forever in Your Eyes. And I meant that, and I wrote that, and we, I sung it at our wedding, but I meant that because I knew at this moment, this is the one I'm devoting my life to. This is the one for all others I'm forsaking and devoting myself to her. So I can see forever in her eyes. Her, she, her eyes are the ones I can see us living out of the rest of our lives together. And this... The reason I say that is because I didn't even have this doctrine. I didn't know who Lester Summerall was. I didn't know these things, but I did know that when you get married, that's supposed to be for life. Now, again, we know we're going to have a lesson on divorce. It's not always, we'll say, one, one spouse's fault. We'll, we'll say, they use the expression, it takes two to tango. But sometimes when your dance partner leaves you on the floor by yourself, that may not be your fault. But... The heart behind it is when we do get married, it should be forever. And with this, as, Do as Lex Dr. Lester Summerall said, marriage is not a temporary arrangement. It is a commitment for life. That's how serious we need to take this and not rush into things, but make sure that the marriage is biblical even before the marriage where you say, I do. It needs to be biblical and handled properly so that when you do say, I do, that both of you are saying, you, you understand what you're saying by saying that of saying, I know we're going to have hard days ahead. I know we're going to have rough seasons, but I'm committed to this. I'm committed to God. I'm committed to you, and I've got forever in your eyes, and I've got forever committed in my heart to this marriage. Amen. Divorce is not an option. And, of course, we said, with the exception of biblical reasons to be discussed in the lesson. But divorce should not be your trump card. All right, that's it. We're getting divorced. That's it. We're getting divorced. That should not be the card that you keep pulling out. I would dare say, I, could, I think we could accurately apply this to what Reverend Ray Bench has said. When quit is on the table, you'll want, you won't see your, your solutions. When divorce is on the table, you won't see the solutions that are really there. So you take divorce off the table. So we're going to well, maybe amend Reverend Ray Bench's saying there. But take divorce off the table and look at all the other solutions. Now, I will say... As we've said, and we're going to cover this in the lesson, sometimes maybe the other spouse, maybe they are not willing to take divorce off the table, but if we're walking with God and we say, all right, from, my, from what I see and from the Word of God, there's no biblical reason for divorce here. Now, if the other spouse says, well, I'm doing it anyway, they are forcing your hand. But that doesn't mean that you have to be the one to file the paperwork. You let them, as the Word says, if the, we'll say if the un- unbeliever is willing to, if they're wanting to depart from the believer, then the Bible says let them do so. So that means if they're unwilling to work it out, to 
they're wanting to maybe get in sin or they've never been born again or however the situation is, we know that sometimes that will force somebody's hand and they, have, they are left with no other options. But that shouldn't be our heart is to say, well, you know what, I'm just going to keep this as the trump card and use it anytime I feel like it. No, 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 that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. Don't do that. Take divorce off the table. Matthew 19, 6, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God has joined that no man put asunder. Again, this same thought is spoken by Jesus in Matthew to not let man pull apart what God has joined together. This should be motivation for all married couples to resolve conflicts to restore peace and love within the marriage. Conflict resolution takes teamwork. Conflict resolution takes teamwork. In most circumstances, each spouse may have committed a wrong with at least one part of the issue at hand. No one is perfect, hence the need for Christians to produce the fruit of the Spirit, even when the flesh desires to fulfill the exact opposite. No one is perfect. Your spouse is not perfect. Your pastor is not perfect. You're not perfect. No, your best friends are not going to be perfect. There's so many people in this life. Whenever you're dealing with people, you're going to deal with imperfection. So it's best for us just to say, all right, I can give grace, I can give mercy. There's going to come a time where I can't, it's, it's going to be far more than what we'll say is proper for me to extend grace and mercy. So that's the reason we rely so heavily on the Bible. What does the Word say? How does, what does the Word say about handling this situation? What does the Word say about this? Do I turn the other cheek or do I dust off my shoes? Because there's biblical precedence for, either, for both of those. So we got to be able to judge, all right, what does the Word say about this? How do I properly handle this? Now, again, that dusting your shoes off is not divorce. We're talking about when people will say outside of your marriage do things. So anyway, no one is perfect, hence the need for Christians to produce the fruit of the Spirit, even when the flesh desires to fulfill the exact opposite. Galatians 5, and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us, is love. It means unselfish concern for others. Joy. We say inner peace. This is the amplified version. Patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting. That's one of the reasons I wanted to bring the Amplified on this, is because it says not the ability to wait, it's how we act while we're waiting. (laughs) That's like when you go to the dentist's office or you go to the doctor's office and you see people waiting. Well, you got some people who's, you know, they're just looking at the magazines or people just scrolling on their phone, and they're just patiently waiting. They don't have... they know that they're there, and they're going to be there until the doctor, whoever it is, or whatever it is they're waiting for, they're going to be there until they're seen, until they're done. Then you got other people, it just acts like the world revolves around them. <sighs> why are you keeping me here so long? Why, why can't I, my appointment was at this time? I mean, it just starts going off on people. So that shows that they don't have this patience. It's how we act while we're waiting. Same thing could be said while we're waiting on God. How do we act while we're waiting on God? How do we act while we're waiting on our spouse? Now, again, we're all going to be guilty of some of these things. It's just going to flare up from time to time, but we've got to catch it as it happens to say, all right, God, help me with this. Help me to bring my patience back into where it's supposed to be. Help me to not be rash about things. Help me to get this back in proper control. Amen. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Biblical marriage should have these fruit within each spouse, creating more unity each day. A true test of character is if these fruits can be produced on a routine basis with family, especially within a marriage. Because family is who you're more familiar with. Like at church, you could be so nice and so just so patient and so kind. And there's been a few times I've been guilty of this because I get, you know, with all my sheep, I can love on y'all and just know that it's that pastoral anointing, that pastoral grace. And then to get home and Elijah do something, I'm like, Elijah, why did you do that? And get mad at him. Or mad at one of the boys. Or even Miss Tiffany. Why? Because you get more familiar with family. Then I have to say, forgive me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have been that, that rash or that frustrated that easy. Forgive me. Why? Because it's not right. So we've got to be mindful of true character is who we really are around when we're, when we're the most comfortable. We could also say when no one else is looking... But here we're talking about relationships, and if we are more familiar within family relationships, we may, be, we may come out as our true self, and we've got to be mindful of that. 
Because that's really what we need to work on. Amen. So while it may be easier to produce these fruit for someone that is that will not be around long enough to truly try that person's fruit, producing these fruit within the home is the key to a blessed home and a biblical marriage. Amen. Teamwork opens the door for intimacy. When working together on various tasks daily, a biblical marriage will be blessed on emotional, which deepens the emotions between husband and wife, the natural, by accomplishing things, and spiritual, connecting husband, wife, and God on levels. So, in other words, we could say, when working together on various daily tasks, a biblical marriage will be blessed on emotional, natural, and spiritual levels. Part of the emotional relationship is that it is deepened through teamwork is the closest, closeness that a wife can feel in having a protector, provider, best friend as her husband helps her and knowing she is not alone. A husband can feel the emotions of being needed as, as his wife's man when helping her, supported by his wife when she, when she helps him, and knowing he is not alone. Notice there's some common things, knowing each other are not alone. Amen. When this closeness is confirmed regularly, the relationship will get more intimate on various levels. Holding hands, kissing, flirting, and other intimate activities become more frequent due to the nature of the relationship not being isolated or burdensome with only one spouse carrying the load. When you know that you're not the only one in this and you have somebody helping you, it, it allows more time for holding hands, kissing, flirting, other intimate activities, and not just not just allowing time, but it creates that bond of you desire that. Why? Because you know you're in this together. So even the activities of holding hands, kissing, flirting, etc., take teamwork in recognizing whether the other spouse is acceptive or not of these advances and if the timing is appropriate. Not every moment is appropriate for such activity, but when teamwork is more present, more time and opportunities can be made for this type of intimacy. Now, this goes... For either spouse, there's times where we'll say probably more times than not that men are more trying to see, we'll say, trying to maybe throw rocks in the bush to see if you know if she's wanting to, if she's willing to be intimate. We we get that, but there's also been I've seen I've witnessed this firsthand where wives will be all over the husband, and you're like, hey, we're all here. You're not in the hotel room by yourself. So come on, get, compose yourself. So just, you know, you can maybe hold hands or kiss him on the cheek or kiss him on the lips, you know, whatever. But you don't need a make-out session or groping all over him or whatever. You don't need to be doing that while the rest of us are standing here or the rest of us are sitting here. So it kind of goes both ways. You need to be know what is appropriate and what's not. You can show affection to your spouse and all the rest of us will think, oh, that's so awesome. Look at them. They're so in love. They love each other. But then there's other times you're like, all right, y'all need to get a room. And at this point, I'm willing to pay for it if you'll just go get a room. Because it's like, come on, you got to be mature and know, know your, be aware of your surroundings. <laughs> huh. So let's face it, a, a man is usually ready to be intimate on any given level, especially the most intimate one of lovemaking. So he should be more of a team player to help his wife with the responsibilities of life to make more time and opportunities for intimacy. Husbands should, focus, should not focus on sex as the end goal of why they help their wives, but instead focus on giving their lives to their wives and reaping the benefits of that love and devotion. So having, I would dare say, having this sole focus of sex being the end game, that's selfish. That's selfish. Amen. <laughs> I'm a man, I can say that. That's selfish. When, you, when that's your end goal, that's selfish. That's not really love making. Anyway, when you really have a heart for your spouse, you'll want to help, you know, especially men, you'll want to help her on many levels because you love her. And then the, maybe the benefit of that is intimacy. So, anyway. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives. Seek the highest good for her and surround her with a caring, unselfish love. Word of God. Not my opinion. <laughs> Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. To love someone to the point of giving, one's, to giving up oneself for another is the highest form of love and honor. This should be the heart of every husband. John 15.13 Greater love in no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. If, if, your wife, if your wife is supposed to be your best friend, why not lay down your life for her? 
<laughs> uh, so there are some guys, if it was to be, if it was to be a, a, a thief or somebody come in with a gun, there are some men that would grab their wives and use them as a body shield. That's, that's no different than having the secret service that's not going to protect you. <laughs> They're designed to be there to protect you and take care of you. Not question, are they going to be loyal? That's the, that's the ones that's supposed to have your life at the most interest of their life. They use their lives to protect yours. So husbands should use their lives to protect their wives, not just provide for them, but protect them as well. For many husbands, sacrificing their life is not a requirement, but sacrificing a nap, a hobby, TV time, or some other desire to help be the teammate their wife needs is necessary. Amen. (laughs) Marriage is like a bank account. Now, I did get this from Pastor Chris, and actually a story he has told of his father that told him while he was in college. He didn't say marriage is like a bank account. He said a relationship is like a bank account. Because at that time, and I'm going to, I guess tell off my pastor for a minute. He's told this publicly, so I can tell it. But he said that while he was in college, there was a season that he didn't go home and visit his parents. But yet his parents were paying for everything. They kept putting money into, you know, help, helping him get through, helping him do things in college. Not for everything, but they were helping take care of him and help him pay for things, pay for his school, stuff like that. So at one point, his dad said, son, you haven't been home in a while. He said, this relationship's like a bank account. You keep, you keep withdrawing and you're making no deposits. So guess what Pastor Chris did? He went home and visited his parents. So I took that story, kind of that concept, and applied it here. Marriage is like a bank account. If only one person takes, it will be depleted of all positive standing. It will be depleted of all positive standing. Marriage requires both spouses to make a deposit, especially the husbands, to keep it in a healthy status. Because nine times out of ten, it's the husband that's not going to be the giver. He's not going to be the one that deposits the most. He'll be the one that pulls the most. Now, that's not, a, not, not 100% across the board. I get that. But for the majority, that's the way it usually goes. So that's the reason you find a lot of these lessons are more geared toward husbands. Because <laughs> uh, they're the ones that, you know, especially in our region, they're the one that's a little more stoic or, or stubborn. And we've got to help, see, help them see the word of God and how a marriage should be, how a husband should be. 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. That means, this amplifies, says, with great gentleness and tact. Tact. Gentleness and tact. And with an intelligent regard for the marriage relationship. Oh, dear Jesus. An intelligent regard for the marriage relationship. With a region like ours, that verse needs to be put out there. We need to put that on a billboard. I think we need to rent a couple billboards in town and put this verse out there on an amplified version. As with someone physically weaker, since she is a woman, show her honor and respect as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered or ineffective. That means if you don't love your wife the way that you should, your prayers to your God get hindered. (laughs) That's what the Word of God says. Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words for husbands to know how important it is to have the proper mindset for treating wives correctly. Husbands must be not only the teammate, but the team captain that acts and gives directions. When the captain leads correctly, the whole team wins. When the captain leads correctly, the whole team wins. Exodus 34, 6 says, Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Or we would say faithfulness. This verse is is another display of how the Lord treats the people of God. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands are to assist by being gracious, slow to anger, having lots of loving kindness, being faithful to their wife and their marriage, and having compassion. When each spouse, especially husbands, ensures that they are being an active teammate, this helps the other spouse, especially wives, feel the love and support they need or desire. So now let's read this and we'll take out the, we'll say the general aspect of roles. So when each spouse ensures that they are being an active teammate, this helps the other spouse feel the love and support they desire, they need or desire. Because really we can see that this is, I wrote this to be applied for 
either one because both need to fulfill and receive this, we'll say this thought, but we inserted in parentheses the exact ones that generally, we'll say typically, need this direction more. <laughs> when each spouse ensures that they are being an active teammate, well, generally speaking, who's the less active teammate? The husband. We get it. But both need to be active. This helps the other spouse feel the love and support they need or desire. Knowing love, kindness, and support are present will help a wife get her love, give her, her love to her husband the way he desires and she desires because he is displaying love in a manner she desires or needs. So we'll say that again. Knowing love, kindness, and support are present really it will help either spouse. But speaking of love, kindness, and support, we, again, typically need that more from the men than the, because the women, ladies are usually more apt to just to give that. They're more apt, it's just in them to give, to nurture, to support, to love, and to show that kindness, to show that. Now, that doesn't mean that every once in a while there's a Jezebel because she may ruin the record of you pure ladies, but she needs to show that kindness and support as well. But typically, it's men that need to be this as well. And that also should let us know that a Jezebel lines up more with a man than what she should, which goes back to the feminism that lines up more with trying to be like a man instead of being what God designed to be a woman. Because generally speaking, women are more of the giver. They're more of the support. They're more of the, have the kindness, have more of the grace, the love that, come, that wants to come out of them. And you really have to be stubborn to, we'll say, suppress that gifting and that gracing that God has given on a natural born woman to suppress that to become a feminist where you don't show that love, compassion, support, kindness. You don't allow those things to just burp up out of you. So you don't allow those things to come out naturally. So it really is damning that it takes more effort to we'll say, suppress what God has put in you to become something you think that you should be. Now, that could preach on a whole other level. 